Okay, episode 34, we're back. Thanks Valley Wide Glass for uh, sponsoring us, making our trip possible. And uh, we're here with the man, the legend, the guy we always talk about. I'm taking his uh, program on checkinstitute.com, learning so much, and we're fucking thankful to have people like this to learn from. Because back in the day, all we'd have is random books to look at. But now we have the internet and now we get to meet him in real life. We've been doing some badass shit all day. And uh, thanks, Paul, for having us over. Hey, my pleasure. Welcome to heaven. Seriously. Nailed Man, it. We've been having a fucking awesome day out here, stacking rocks, just being around the heaven house. Penny, cook some. Penny's amazing. Drumming. Awesome, awesome drumming. Meals. How sweet was drumming? Dude. That was the first time I ever drummed like that. Got fired up drumming. So what would you even call yourself? You're, you're an author. You have books. Like, I can't think of anything besides guru. <laughs> <laughs> well, guru means teacher, really. Uh, people think of it as something else, but really the meaning of guru is teacher. But I don't think of myself as a guru. I am a holistic health practitioner. Holistic health practitioner. And you see by all the books in his library that a wealth of knowledge. Like this is very few that you can – there's a compared to how much he's actually got in here. Yeah, this is just one – section of my library yeah it's it's amazing like i said yeah if you haven't heard of paul check look him up on instagram just google him and start just researching about him and i i always mention it when people ask me hey what book should i get i how to eat move and be healthy that's going to cover all your bases if you have all the bases covered and how to eat move and help be healthy you're going to be sitting pretty good i would think yeah yeah and it's c-h-e-k because a lot of people search my name as c-h-e-c-k mm-hmm so it's uh, chekinstitute.com or Paul Check if you're searching on Amazon just or just type in how to eat, move, and be healthy. Heck yeah. So we we're, we always talk about it all the time, like how big of an impact eating is. Yeah. And a lot of people, our generation that are in their young 20s or coming out of high school, didn't learn it in high school. Their parents never taught them how to eat. Uh, school never taught us how to eat. No one taught us how to eat. So you're kind of on your own figuring it out how to eat. So just almost a quick breakdown. How important is it to eat good, clean, healthy food? Well, you are what you eat. I mean, if you just really meditate on that, all we got to do is starve you and you start to disappear, don't you? Yeah. And you can't get by without water. So, you know, if you look at it, the soil... The quality of the soil determines the quality of the plant. You can't have a healthier plant than you have soil. So the first thing to understand about nutrition is that nutrition really is based in the soil. If you have good organic soil and a good microorganism population and a good fungal population, they feed the plant. They work with the plant symbiotically. There's something the plant gives them and something that they give the plant, for example, 85% of all plants in the world are what are called mycorrhiza formers, which means they have a relationship with the fungi in the soil. The fungi love the sweetness in their sap. So what the fungi do is they set up networks around the root system of the plant, and they will kill any of the parasitic organisms like worms that try to eat the plant. The fungi will capture them, bore a hole into them, and eat them from the inside and feed them to the plant. So there's your first tip. Most plants are carnivorous. Most vegetarians don't realize that. <laughs> and so the, micro, the, the, the uh, fungi have powerful acids that can dissolve minerals. They can dissolve rocks. So what they do is they dissolve rocks into liquid minerals and feed them to the plants. So the plants get mineral and other animal flesh input and nutrients from the fungi and in trade the fungi get the sugar or the carbohydrates in the sap of the plant. So they perfectly support each other. So there's a, without going through the whole, what's called the soil food web, everything in the earth has a working relationship with the plant life and the tree life coming out of it. So they, the better each one does, the better the other one does because they're serving each other, right? The more sugar a plant can produce to share with the fungi, 
the happier the fungi are, so the more they get excited and keep feeding it and supporting it. Just, you know, there's an old saying, don't fuck with the chef, <laughs> right? We all guys know that. Don't mess with the chef because yeah. we all get hungry, and that's really important. So the plant life has this rela- beautiful relationship with the soil microorganisms and the, and, the, and the ones that everybody keeps killing with all the pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and rodenticides, right? So that's the first point I'm making is you've got to eat organic food or it's toxic food from dead soils because those things kill the micro life that actually feed the whole plant. <laughs> so uh, then once you have a high quality food, organic food, and you're using free range animals that have not been fed commercial garbage uh, or, or wild caught fish, then the next thing you do is you pay attention to the symptoms that your body is giving you. What I normally tell people to do is look, just challenge yourself and say, okay, today I'm going to eat nothing but meat or, or fish, flesh foods all day. And then write down in a journal, wow, you know, I ate, I ate a big chunk of steak for breakfast and nothing else. And now I'm feeling full, but I'm just freaking craving something sweet or vegetable or something because your body's saying you need something to help metabolize all that fat and protein, right? Think of fat and protein like firewood. The fattier and the heavier it is, the more it is like a wet log. Think of carbohydrates like kindling. Well, you can't start a decent fire without kindling wood, right? You just can't put a big log on there and hold a match to it. It won't work. So, Each of us has a different genetic background and a a different metabolic set point and different biochemistry. No two people have the same biochemistry, not even identical twins. So we're in a process of constantly learning to pay attention to what our body's telling us so we know, okay, when I ate only meat, these things felt good, but this didn't feel good, and my mind either worked better or worse, my vision was either better or worse, my ability to balance myself and move in space, you'll notice if you just pay attention, like all you got to do is eat a couple teaspoons of sugar and watch all sorts of stuff change. You get high and looped out and your vision will get blurry. I mean, if you're healthy. Yeah. And you'll just, you'll just go, your metabolism, your, your nervous system gets jacked up and you feel like you're on crack cocaine or something. I mean, even that would kill me. I wouldn't even opt for that. But my point is, there's a simple example where you can pay attention to what happens. Now, the opposite end of that would be to eat fat. So just eat peanut butter, right? So sometimes I challenge people, if they like peanut butter or nut butter, I say, just so you can experience what it's like to live on fat, eat nothing but fat, like bacon fat or the fat off a steak or the duck fat or uh, cashew butter or almond butter, which is mostly fat. Just eat, try eating a butter all day and it will teach you what parts of your body and your, your overall self respond well to fats based on where you're at at that time. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes people say, oh man, I could have eaten peanut butter for days. Well, what they just told me is their body's fat starved. So I say, okay, now try eating nothing but vegetables all day right? No meat. And what happens? Oh, I felt fantastic. Next guy, I wanted to kill somebody. I was starving all day long and I hated feeling full, but being starving at the same time. Well, that's somebody who needs more fat and protein to optimally run their metabolism. So you can eat all fat one day, all meat one day and all vegetables another day. And you just keep notes on what's happening about your body. And you say, well, when I ate all meat, I really felt like I could have eaten this much salad. That would have been my instinct. Okay, good. Next time, eat the same amount of meat, but add exactly the amount of salad that your instinct tells you. And you might all of a sudden notice, man, I feel perfect. Yeah. Okay? Now, the next time you sit down to eat that same meal, it may or may not be after a hard workout. And if this one wasn't after a hard workout, but the next one is like when I deadlift... I get so hungry for flesh for two days. But if I don't work out at all, I can go vegetarian and feel fantastic. In fact, I feel better than if I eat meat. Damn. Right? That's good. Mm -hmm. So what I've learned from really honoring the wisdom of my body and listening to it and, and seeing how your emotions and your mind react to these food changes, that 
when I listen to the consciousness of my body and my inner self, when I let go of my ego and just say, how am I feeling right now? There's a difference between how am I feeling and I love chocolate or I love donuts. <laughs> And I'm going to eat them. No matter the, whether or not I've gained 50 pounds in the last two years, I got zits all over and I feel like shit, but I love those donuts. Yeah. That's not listening. That's just, that's your mind eating, not your body. See, when your mind eats, because your mind doesn't have a need for food, it, eat, it eats based on an idea. The idea is that the donut is associated with times in your life when you are happy. So you think you're eating a donut, but you're actually eating a memory of all the times you were happy because there was a donut in your hand. <laughs> so psychologically, the donut's fulfilling your desire for happiness. And since you're yeah. not creating enough for yourself, you have to have the donut to pretend that you're happy. But the donut's making your body sick. So the point I'm making is you don't listen to your head because that's what got you in trouble in the first place. Mm -hmm. You listen inside of yourself and you think, how do I feel inside right now? My breathing's a bit tight. Hmm. I'm going to write that down. The next time you eat vegetables, I noticed last time my breathing was tight. Oh my God, I feel like I can breathe so much easier. Wow, these vegetables really help my breathing. That's wild. I never would have thought that. My joints ached last time after I ate all that meat. I noticed that my back, my shoulders, and my neck were sore. I ate all these vegetables today. Damn, I don't have any joint pain at all. Okay, well, if we keep playing the game, what's going to happen is this guy's going to realize, damn, my body likes vegetables and it doesn't like meat and it doesn't like a lot of fat either. And you will think, I figured it out. And two weeks later, you'll be eating your vegetables and all of a sudden something else will start going weird. Why is that happening? Hmm. I wonder what I should do now. Well, what does your body crave? Look at the food options in front of you. Well, there's chicken in the refrigerator, there's eggs, there's fish, there's beef. Hmm. Boy, when I think of eggs right now, I feel good. Yeah, eggs, just thinking of eggs makes my body feel good. I can feel it relaxing. <gasps> Let's try some eggs. Oh, my God, I ate the eggs and I feel good again. I got the new diet. Let me write a book and tell everybody to eat eggs and vegetables. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? So the moral of the story is, Depending on what's going on in your mental life, your emotional life, and how you're using your body physically, and how much physical trauma you've taken, like fighters are getting physically traumatized from mm -hmm. the outside. People are punching you, breaking down tissue, leaving bruises, cuts. So the more trauma there is, the more of the protein and fat resources that you need based on your genetics. So when I do heavy deadlifts, there's a lot of micro trauma. Well, my body says, I don't want to make muscle out of grass, dude. Give me some molecules so it's quick. I can just take that muscle and turn it into muscle. Boom, boom, hop, hop. And so we're each wired for specific needs based on the regions of the world we, our, our gene line evolved. But the two key points I'm making, how do you eat good? One, you got to eat good, good food that comes from good soil or you're just playing a game with yourself. Two, you got to figure out how to listen to your body and let it tell you what it needs, and you can challenge it by eating one thing at a time and taking notes, and then you learn every time there's something going on with you, it's your body saying there's something that you're not paying attention to with the choices that you're making. What worked two days ago isn't right for what's happening inside of you right now. So that becomes a spiritual practice, mm -hmm. because most people live outside of their body, and the closest they get is what they see in the mirror. Right. So. The only way they identify themselves is what they see in the mirror or what they see on a camera. That's why people love staring at themselves on cameras. But when you practice what I'm teaching you, you actually have to spend time inside and saying, yeah, d where do, how do I feel right now? How ready am I for a hard workout right now? What happens when I pick up my starting weight? Does it feel heavy? Hmm, yes, well, I had popcorn last night. Yep, that's the feeling of global inflammation. That's when the mind eats something the body says, I'm not so excited about that. Mm. So then you start paying attention and you realize what foods work well for enhancing my exercise performance and recovery. And you'll find the same foods work well for mental performance because if your body works well, then your mind is happy. If your body's sick, so is your mind because they both live off the same blood, mm -hmm. right? You can't have a healthy body uh, I mean, you can't have a, a, a sick body and a healthy mind because the same thing that feeds your brain, which is the interface between mind and body, 
feeds the rest of your body. Damn. Yeah, and it's That's amazing. Good. It's amazing to me too how much people don't put that those two together. What I eat is gonna feel how good I think and how clear I think and how mm-hmm. good I sleep. And just like when I told you about Paul, I was like, watch this guy. Look at how strong he is at his age, and look how clear he talks. And look at, just look at him. Mm-hmm. So people don't put that together how they how they're thinking how their how their emotions take because we I over mean control. when you you don't really put that together unless someone helps you someone teaches you yeah and really what put it together for me is after I think after I broke my jaw and I was just sitting there and Mariah showed me uh, you on Aubrey Marcus I think and I started looking into it and I was like whoa he's really onto something but people don't put that together they don't put together how you're thinking and your emotions taken over because of what you're eating and it's it's kind of surprising. That's the last totally. thing they'll they'll talk about. So even so, for you, what's a day? What's a f- almost a full day of normal eating for you? Uh, I'll give you a typical day, but I, I want to say something f- to share with all of you. Um, I want to share a definition of what the mind is, because once you understand what the mind is, this whole conversation starts to make a lot more sense. This comes, this is the best definition of mine out there from Dr. Daniel Siegel, who's a famous psychiatrist and is a very intelligent, holistic, spiritual man. Mind, an embodied process that regulates the flow of energy and information. Mind, something you wear, it's embodied. Something has to be there to control the flow of energy and information. The shape of your body is a cosmic antenna, and you bring in different energy and information than a dog does because your spine's vertical and your dimensions are different. If you change the dimensions of an antenna, you change what signal frequencies it can receive. So then you say, okay, well, Uh, Tim, you're built different than I. Sean, you're built different than I. We all have enough differences that we are naturally more capable of tuning into certain frequencies than others, right? Certain people are gifted in certain ways, but how your body uh, is shaped and how balanced it is, if you have joints that won't work, like how many athletes, even fighters, get stuck in this position, and when they stand up, They can't stand up straight, so their head's on top of their hips, which is on top of their feet. They're down here because they're still in this position. Yeah. Okay? So that person cannot change the frequency of their antenna. So if you study the science of yoga and what masters have taught us for thousands of years, each of what you call a yoga posture changes the position of the aerial. When I was a young guy, they didn't have cable. You had to have aerials on television, and the signal changed with the weather. So if it started to get stormy out, you had to keep shortening or lengthening or opening or closing the aerials until all of a sudden the signal came clean. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you that if you change the position and the size of an aerial, it changes what it tunes into. So each of the postures in yoga puts you in a position that energizes certain chakras and makes you more tapped into certain levels of consciousness. Same with Tai Chi. Why do you think they teach you a lot about alignment of your spine? Because it's aligning the frequencies in your body so you have maximum reception from the highest to the lowest. So you have the broadest bandwidth, right? And not. So whenever a body's stuck energetically, there's frequencies in the cosmos and in the earth environment that it can't access anymore, so it can actually lead you to a form of psychological starvation, but then you try to fill it with food. So the, the point I'm making is the body and the mind is embodied. And how you use your body, like how do you feel when, you, when your body tells you you need to move and you go to the gym and you have a great workout, you walk out of there feeling alive, don't you, right? Because you've changed your body, so you've changed your mind. You've enhanced your mind. You've given it the right neurochemicals and the right level of stimulus, and your body and your mind interface, right? So if you think of a two-way radio like in a police car or a ham radio, if you pour a McDonald's milkshake into the thing (laughs) and wonder why you're having a hard time getting a hold of anybody, well, it's the wrong stuff to put in a exotic radio well 
your body's the most complicated piece of equipment in the entire fucking universe, so if you pour shit into it, what do you expect? Fuck yeah. God, my mom drinking a diet pop the other day. I'm like, Mom, what are you doing? She's like, I'm do- I've am doing. i been doing good. I'm like, I know. Then why are you drinking a diet pop? <laughs> oh, it drives me nuts. Well, the diet pops are actually more toxic than, That's the, what I was than the other ones. You know, The chemicals they put in there and the shit they put in there is actually nastier than the sugar you're trying to avoid. <sighs> oh. And the other thing, uh, just as a side note, it causes what's called a cephalic phase response. Cephalus means brain. But when you drink diet sodas, because they have artificial sweeteners in them, they trick the brain into thinking that sweetness is on the way, so it liberates more energy out of the brain cells because it thinks sugar's on the way, and the whole body will react because the senses of the body, when they taste something sweet, the body will start speeding up its metabolism, thinking, okay, I can afford to spend some energy now, but what happens is when the brain cells don't get the sugar they need because you're on a diet soda, it causes you to have what's called a cephalic phase response where you go from a high to a low. It's like when you're exhausted after training. Mm -hmm. If you try to train too frequently, you burn out. So when you drink diet sodas, the the system thinks the sugar's there, so it reacts like there's sugar there, but then when it doesn't come, it goes into a depressive state. So what do people do? They reach for another one, and that's very profitable. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. So is that the same with stevia? Yeah, tech. I don't. I think stevia is better. Stevia has a blood sugar managing effect. Oh, so but it doesn't spike your blood sugar. Yeah, um, most of the diet sodas though don't use uh, stevia. They use other uh, artificial Aspartame sweeteners. And stuff. Asp- yeah, that kind Shit of stuff. Pain. There's uh, z- uh, xylitol. It's been a while since I looked into them, but when you look into the research on these things, they're, they're not very good for you. So, like a day of eating for you, wake oh, up, yeah. an average day. Uh, I typically get up in the morning i do my meditations and uh, uh yeah in it with the day eating your night daily and nightly routines because yeah that's what i'm starting off i come i get up early i usually get up around 5 30 get to work about 6 6 30 6 30 and then i do my meditations and my prayers and my practice of worship i have a whole practice i go through and then i return my email and then i do some correspondence and then i go to the gym so usually by the time I get out of the gym, it's about 10.30 to 11, and then I'll have breakfast, and I'll just eat. That's your first time eating all day? Yeah. Um, I tend, because I, in meditation, I don't want to have heavy food and, and flush food too much in me because it, it changes the frequencies you can get too easily. I can get there, but you got to work against it. Hmm. Um so anyhow, uh, then I'll work, uh, see clients, and then um, sometimes I, I just have a quick bite in the afternoon because if I have clients too close together, because a lot of the stuff I do with people is pretty deep, so I, mm-hmm. I, I don't say, okay, the hour's up, bye. Uh, I might end up in a two-and-a-half-hour process because there's a lot of emotional movement or, or deep relationship work going on or something like that, but... Uh, Typically, I'll eat lunch uh, around 3, anywhere between 1.30 and 3. If I haven't worked out in the morning because I got too busy, I'll go work out after I finish with clients. Then I'll eat lunch after that. And it's just basically whole, good, clean, whole food, just, organic food. I just eat meat and vegetables and juice. Uh, I don't do much juice because I had a bad fungal infection when I was a kid and nobody knew what it was. So I got a deep fungal infection, which means it got inside my body. Once you have a deep fungal infection, you have a fungal infection for life. So any sugar just jacks my whole system up and causes lots of problems. So I can do juices that are more toward the bland side, but I can't do sweet juices and fruit juices. And uh, my body's very sensitive to sugar uh, because of that. But I feel... I do some, you know, I'll, Penny has these nice juices that she gets with probiotics, and we have some very high-end, and she'll make juice for me and mix vegetables and stuff with a little bit of, like, green apple or something. Um, but I don't do well just on juice. I do better on solid, you know, a piece of chicken or... Eggs. Eggs, yeah. I like, you know, my, one of my favorite ways to eat is she just make me some nice duck or chicken or... Uh, turkey or something and she'll just leave me a chunk of meat and some chopped up raw vegetables and I I feel like my energy my mental clarity 
Um, I don't, I recover from training a lot better when I just keep it nice and clean and simple like yeah. that. I, I just try to, I've learned over the years that, that just keeping your diet to things you would have eaten if you were here a thousand years ago is pretty much the way to keep your body from getting caught with all the shit they put in foods. I mean, even the stuff they sell as health food is loaded with crap they haven't put on the label. Man, those naked juices that they oh, say, oh, God. naked juices. Yeah. Yeah. See There's like 96 that. grams of sugar in it. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, And People it's crazy, trying. too. The longer you stay away from sugar, the more you just don't really crave it. You don't even really have the... Well, you, it feeds funguses and parasites. You see, so oftentimes it's the bugs releasing the chemicals to trick your body into craving it. Once you get a fungal or parasite infection, they can modulate your entire internal biochemistry to make you just be absolutely addicted to all the shit they like to eat. And they, they love junk food. They love sugar. They're decomposers, you see. So they break down whatever's not working in nature anymore and try to convert it into the soil to make something useful out of it. So whenever you're eating more sugar than your... Uh, you see, if you eat more sugar than, than your microorganism population can do well and keep itself in balance, then you start feeding the bad guys. So the bad populations grow too much because it over and it starts feeding all the fungus. Uh -huh. So once you start feeding too many funguses and, and, and a lot of the bad microorganisms do better on the junk food like processed food, they're more after that stuff. The healthy microorganisms don't seem to like that stuff. They only like the good stuff. Um, so once you pay attention to like it doesn't matter how good the juice is could be the best damn juice and the best apples and the best juicer in the world that doesn't mean your body does well on it right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good sugar is still sugar it's too much carbohydrate for some bodies so uh it doesn't matter how good any food is it's the ratio that your body needs uh, that's what's so sad about seeing kids come into the gym they have a McDonald's Frappuccino. And Frappuccino and they're just eating chicken nuggets from McDonald's. It's so sad. See, it like hurts my heart. I'm like, God, why? And they just don't know any better. Especially for fighters. Um, there's a book called The Living Soil and the Holly Experiment by Lady Eve Balfour, who really is the pioneer of the whole concept of organic okay. food. It was published in 1943. It's right in my office here. Um, and in there, she researched uh, how people reacted to organic food and they did many tests on animals and looked at their health and they would do things like take uh, commercially raised food with the normal pesticides like they were commercial farmers would be using and, and NPK uh, fertilizers. Then they would have uh, food that was grown on soil that hadn't had anything added to it, no fertilizer, nothing. They just left it neutral. Then they had food grown on organic soil where they properly balanced the soil microorganisms and fertilized it properly with, with proper animal f poop fertilizer, not chemical fertilizer. And so they would put this three different feeders in hog pens and cow pens and any animal's pen. And they said every single time the animals went to the organically raised food and ate it till it was completely gone before they would touch Damn. the other food. Then they went to the second best and ate it all till it was gone. And only when they had no choice would they eat the commercially raised food. And they found that animals on average consumed about one third less food in volume if it was certified organic food than if it was any Whoa. of the other kinds. Because the nutrient density is so much higher, they, the brain satiety centers get triggered much sooner because the body will keep you eating until it gets the vitamins, minerals, trace minerals, phenolics, terpenes, and alkaloids, or whatever the chemicals it needs to balance your, meta your, your physiology, it'll tell you to keep eating more. So like if your liver's backed up and someone says, hey, you want to try some artichoke heart? Oh, yeah, yeah. And next thing you know, you're like, oh, my God, give me another one. Because your body's saying, I need them chemicals, right? <laughs> and artichokes are very good for, for liver detoxification. So like when you just pay attention to how you're feeling. And so say you, you say you're feeling angry all the time. Well, you might look on the internet, oh, anger in Chinese medicine is the negative emotion of the liver. So when the liver's under stress, you're prone to anger. Oh, neat. So, okay, so what foods support the liver? Well, rare, right on the top of the list, artichokes, cruciferous vegetables, whatever. And you say, okay, now I'm gonna go try a bunch of those and see which ones feel good. 
And you go, oh man, next time I feel that way, I just got to start eating artichokes and I'm balanced right out. Hallelujah. Damn. Right? So you find out Mother Nature's medicine chest is custom designed not only for your pleasure, but for your health. You just have to be smart enough to pay attention. And all the vitamin people and drug people, they keep taking little pieces out of it. But you got to remember something. Royal Lee made this very clear. Royal Lee was an amazing scientist who was a master of nutrition and started um, standard process laboratories. Royal, says, Royal Lee says, the plant and vitamin, the vitamin complex is not an isolate. It's a complex. Vitamin complexes are made of fats, proteins, minerals, carbohydrates, trace minerals, phenolics, terpenes, alkaloids, and other chemicals that are plant hormones and things like that. But he said the system functions just like a watch. So he says, what part of a watch tells time? whole thing the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> like, god damn it i can't get you this take wrong. a piece off of that watch and it won't work right i'm talking about the internal workings of it of course mm -hmm. he says vitamin complexes function as an integrated system so when and they're myriad times more complicated than anything they can produce in a lab so what they do is they pull a little section out patent it and then they say oh here's your ascorbic acid but if you eat vitamin c from a uh, orange or a lemon or rose hips, you're getting the rest of the complex. Mm -hmm. So when you eat these manufactured supplements, your body has to then go, okay, in order to use that ascorbic acid, I've now got to go get this fat, this protein, this mineral. And so what happens is you can actually create other imbalances because your body is trying to scavenge all the parts to make this damn thing work. And when you get enough of it in you, it becomes toxic. Fuck. But not many people overdose on carrots or lemons, yeah. right? <laughs> you, so the, Take their big vitamin C pill from yeah, Costco. Yeah, popping. They think a little <laughs> bit's good, more is better. And like they, next thing you know, you're, you look at your piss, it's like you could use it as yellow fucking paint. Yeah. <laughs> and it stinks like hell. Yeah. Why? Because your detox systems are just maxed. You're like, Damn. you're on drugs now. <laughs> Body's crazy. Yeah, and it, Mariah always brings it up. She's like, people aren't. She's like, people aren't like you. They don't do the research for themselves, which surprised me. People have these problems, and they won't be like, okay, I'm going to look at five different websites, see what yeah. they all say, compare them. Maybe I'm going to look at a few more websites and compare them. They don't, they don't even do that. They don't take the time to do that. They'll just go to their doctor, go to the urgent care, see yeah. what he says, gives you a pill, and it's, it's hard and it's sad. And, and people that you know are older why? than us don't, don't listen to us because we're younger we're punks we have tattoos oh you guys will learn you guys will learn and <laughs> you know what learn what how to die like them <laughs> yeah, yeah <those laughs> how to too. have a shitty life <laughs> how to be stuck look you, you know what is behind all that laziness and not looking into things religion programs you to do exactly what the book says because ah. that's what god wants and what are doctors? White jackets. Where'd that come from? The priesthood. So makes sense. the whole concept of following the priesthood is built right into medicine. And then the nutritionists do the same thing. And so what you have is a bunch of people that got their training as children to always honor authority because they're expressions of the divine order. The priest is an emissary of God the bishop, the cardinal, even your pastor is the one who's supposed to be leading the flock. So we are conditioned from the very beginning as children to worship authority figures and trust if someone has a doctorate of science degree, they would never mislead you because they're a priest. <laughs> so when you learn how to use that model to make money, you get Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because that and that is that is it too. Because even when I was twenty one in Bellator, I still had that guilt of not going to the church, going to the Joe's Witness. But I had a, I went to a coach named Robert Fallis. I lived with him. He was one of the like the best coaches, MMA coaches out there. Yeah. And he was raised a Jehovah's Witness. And he said, Tim, he's like, you're not a good person because of that religion. Mm -hmm. He's like, research this religion. Do all the research for yourself. Don't listen to other people. Yeah. Do the research for yourself. And that's when I started kind of taking. I'm like oh, fuck, I'm just going to research everything for myself and figure out my own thing. You know what? That's called having your own mind. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no I wanna, shit. I'll, can I share something with you that's yeah. really relevant to that? Because I think this is going to fascinate you. 
you know, Rudolf Steiner was a genius metaphysician, an alchemist. He developed biodynamic farming, the Waldorf school system. He was an expert at astrology. He was a scientist, a trained scientist. He was a clairvoyant. He was a, tr he was a genius in like 10 different ways. I mean, he's one of these people that only comes to planet Earth once in a while, like an, uh, uh, you know, an angelic being wearing a body just to leave us some tips, right? And Steiner's model of the soul, Steiner says anything with an inside and an outside has a soul. So an atom has a perceptible field of activity that's different from that which is around it. So it's got a, it's got a soul. But Steiner's model says at the base of life is the mineral soul. So we all have, we all need minerals. Like your bones wouldn't stay together without minerals and your hormone system couldn't regulate itself. So what we think of as the soul is a conglomeration of outgrowths of different types of energy, information, and intelligence. The mineral soul, where does dirt come from? It's ground up rocks, rocks which are minerals. So the mineral soul is the basis of the biological soul, which is all biological life. Your body is a biological life form. So everything from the single-celled organism up has to have consciousness to differentiate how to regulate what's inside of it from what's outside. If you didn't have that wisdom in you, what would happen if you went out in the cold and your body didn't know to increase your inner temperature and warm you up? Freeze. You'd freeze to death. And if it was too hot, you'd die of heat exhaustion. So the biological self is made of the intelligence of the cells, which is the subconscious mind. Out of that grows the intellectual soul, and that's all the ideas put into our head from the first time our mommy and daddy start talking to us. And that's where we get the ideas about right and wrong and should and shouldn't and what God expects from you and what you've got to do to be acceptable and what parts of your body you shouldn't ever touch and uh, what beliefs you have about sex, dot, 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 right? So that's the intellectual soul. It's the consciousness that we gain above just our bodies and the mineral elements of ourselves about how to work with ideas. Intellect. What you call your ego is actually the intellectual soul. Hmm. Right? You understand that? Your ego is the collection of ideas you use to perceive the difference between you and other people. Ego means border, barrier, or self-definition. It's because you have an ego that you can look at me and say, that's Paul Check and I'm Tim Welsh, and you can do the same because you have an ego. But if you had no ego, you would think I was an extension of you just like your arm, and that's what babies do. They think the couch is them, so they shit and piss on it because they don't have any way to tell <laughs> the difference. That they think everything they see is them, okay? When the child begins to use the word I or no, its ego is forming. It now says no, which means there's something I don't want to be part of me. I know now that I'm not that mouth of food, <laughs> okay? So that's the day the child's ego begins. So beyond the intellectual soul, and here comes the punchline, but there's more, is the awareness soul. Steiner says the awareness soul emerges when you honestly begin to question the beliefs that you thought were yours, but you now realize aren't working for you. Damn. Will God burn me in hell? Is that sound godly? Do I really have to dress a certain way to be accepted? Will God love me if I have long hair? Will God burn me in hell if I masturbate or I have sex with a partner before I marry her? Well, so the instant that you honestly begin looking at all the opinions on both sides of the fence and you get to where you can actually see all the possibilities and say, which one allows me to be most honest about who I am? Which one nourishes me and makes me feel like I have more zest for life by living that way because I'm being true to my inner self? Now the awareness soul is growing. And the awareness soul ultimately is what it takes to challenge all the ideas in your life that you realize are causing problems in relationship to yourself, to others, and to the world, or to diet, or to exercise, or to whatever's getting in the way. Once you grow beyond that, you emerge into the creativity soul. Because now that you got all the shit out of the way, 
you can become highly creative because you aren't addicted to only one way of seeing things and you're capable of realizing there's all this beauty that I never would have looked at. How many Jehovah's Witnesses are amazed at the beauty in Muslim temples or in Hindu temples mm -hmm. or in the awesome stuff in their scriptures. I mean, read Rumi, right? If you want to have your mind blown, read Rumi, a Sufi master, an Islamic mystic, right? Who's so mind-blowingly tap you into God. It's just like being hit by lightning bolts. And you're like, this never happened to me reading the Bible, man. <laughs> this is like, this, these pages fucking dance, man. And so you then, you, you, you just get a spiritual hard on. You go, oh, Eureka. And then you think, fuck. Well, I wonder what else I'm missing out on, right? So the next thing you know, you're reading Kabir, you know, and, or, or, or you find Osho. And you, you just, then you just think, man, this is amazing. There's so much beautiful stuff out there. And each step of the way, you realize, man, I'm a little bit Hindu. I'm a little bit Muslim, and I'm a little bit Christian, and I'm quite a lot Native American. And so you realize who you are, right? And when you realize who you are and you embrace who you are, now you know who you're loving every day or not. And now you know whose fault it is when you feel shitty and you're doing stupid shit and blaming it on everybody else or thinking, poor me, some doctor's got to rescue me. Because now you have the awareness to see how the world actually works. And you realize God is not a malevolent God. God just has a fucking killer sense of humor <laughs> and loves to play all these games, right? When people used to go ask St. Francis of Assisi, I think you might have heard this in my podcast with Aubrey, but, but people would always say to him, how do I find God? And he would say, what you are looking for is what's looking, mm -hmm. right? What, what we're looking for as God is consciousness, and it's inside of us looking out and experiencing through us, and it's the same <laughs> thing that's looking through you, yeah. but having the Tim Welsh experience that's dancing over here. And I mean, how much more fucking magical get it get to yeah. that like do you see the sense of humor in that yeah. <laughs> right and that's what love is love is it demands the illusion of separation how can i say i love you sean if there is no sean that i believe is separate from me it's only because he can become the object of my affection that love can flow from me to him so i define love as the flow of energy and information through empathic, I feel you, and compassionate, I understand you, connection to self or other. Love is the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self or other. So the point I'm making is the ego is an absolute necessary invention because it creates the illusion of separation. I mean, actually, what's your body made of? Earth, water, fire, air, and space. What's mine made of? Earth, water, fire, air, and space. What's yours made of? Earth, water, fire, air, and space. What's yours? What's yours? Where did it come from? Here. Where did everybody's come from? Here. Where did everything we call here come from? The stars. Which star? All of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're everything <laughs> pretending to be something that isn't everything. <laughs> and because of that, we get the experience of love. Fuck. <laughs> I'm glad we got this recorded. But Holy you, shit, I'm going to listen back to that. But don't you Whoa. get it, though? Yeah. yeah like, sure. if she was you and you didn't know it, how would you have a love affair experience with her? Right. You couldn't. Yeah. And if you were a baby having sex with her, you would just think you were having sex with yourself because you have no ego yet. So right. you'd think, oh, this is my other big toe, or <laughs> I have more titties than I thought. How cool. <laughs> Right? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you know, a baby's really like being on a full hit of DMT 24-7. Just, whoa. Yeah, that's <laughs> I, that's why ah! I, lo I love being around kids. That's because I 
how I imagine them. They're just tripping uh, all. They're just like, wow, just everything's just story. crazy. Everything's perfect. Yeah. Except for when we don't take care of them. Yeah. Yeah. But so the, the, the creativity soul merges into the intuitive soul. What is intuition? It's the part of yourself called the universe that can answer all the questions that you can't solve through thinking, feeling, and sensing. There's four key functions to consciousness. Jung identified this. Thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition. Those are the modes of consciousness that we have. So there's, you think about things and you can't figure it all out just with thinking. You feel things and you can't feel, yeah, this is a rock, but you can't tell the mineral composition by feeling it. You have to think about that, look in books or be a scientist. And you can have values, that's the feeling sense. I like this rock or I don't like this rock. But any question that you can't answer with thinking, feeling, or sensing requires intuition. And that means you connect your mind to the mind of the universe and you ask the universe, what's this rock made of? And it tells you. And if you study all the most amazing inventions by the greatest scientists in the world, almost all of them say it came through intuition or through meditative awareness, through meditating and having a flash insight, which is called an intuitive flash. So intuition is what connects you to the rest of the universe. And then you realize for sure you're part of the universe and it's part of you. And beyond that is spirit-soul union, and that's when you become aware enough to realize that whatever we call God is everything, and we can't be here without everything, and everything wouldn't be itself without us because we would leave a hole in the puzzle. Hmm. If the universe was a puzzle, and I knocked Sean out of it, whenever you see a puzzle with a hole missing, where do your eyes go? With a piece missing. Straight to that. Go to the hole. You yeah. have this thing's, you know, it's pretty cool, but fuck, who forgot the last piece? <laughs> it could be the most gorgeous thing in the world, but if there's one piece missing, your eyes go right to what's missing. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons it hurts us so much when someone dies. Because a part of us knows there's a hole in the puzzle. And we have to learn how to fill that with love in ourselves or the hole eats us alive, doesn't it? Damn. So okay. you say, so because your brother committed suicide yeah. when he was how old? 34, I think. And who was there to kind of help you fill that hole? Just God, man. Just you reading, learning. Well, you know, I, I, I had had a lot of death experiences already. And, you know, I'm a remote viewer and an astral traveler. So I have a completely different feeling about death. But. That really fucks people it, up. It did. Oh, it, it it's you know he's he's probably been the feature of gallons of tears and fifty journeys. You know. Yeah. Um, some holes can't be filled. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's oftentimes as painful as it is. That hole is the beginning of our realization of holiness because the pain can be so great that you have to find something grand enough, big enough, and real enough to fill that hole. And the only thing that I've ever seen do it is figuring out what God really is because only, only the power of unconditional love and understanding can, can heal that wound. So God's quite crafty. God sets us up so that we never get too comfortable or we forget what we're really here to do and that's figure out who we really are. And when we figure it out, we always know because we act that way. We don't just talk about it, we do it, mm -hmm. right? So God is a verb, not a noun. We get in a lot of trouble when we think God is something we can name and describe, but then we act like idiots. Yeah. But when you realize God is a verb and God is love, then God is present whenever we're acting with love towards ourselves or other people. Anything else is just a story written on paper that starts wars and ruins families. So I know your mom was like a yogi, right? Yeah, for, for about 24 years she uh, studied uh, self-realization fellowship and uh, Paramahansa Yogananda is the guru of that philosophy. So how old were you when you started like started meditation 12. practice? 12. 12 years old. Damn. 
Holy that's sweet. smokes, that's really cool. And your mom had you do it. Well, she didn't force me to do it. Yeah. She took me to the temple, and the monks taught us, and she invited me to meditate with her. But, you know, when you go to our, the, the Self-Realization Fellowship Temple, that's what you do. You, you get a, 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 a lecture from the monks about some aspect of life, and then you meditate, and you chant, and you, you know, meditate some more, and you, you, you learn to just, it's easier to, to sing and calm yourself when you're with a bunch of people that genuinely are as interested in peace as they are <laughs> everything else. Yeah. So it, it affects you. You know, you, you learn that life can be very different than most people live it. And, you know, after being, my mother was a Christian before we went to Seraphalization Fellowship. You know, I remember being eight years old, being like, totally confused i'm like i'm an eight-year-old and the stuff they're saying about god it scares the hell out of me i mean if god's really that way we're all fucked <laughs> you know and uh i mean how how could you tell me god is love and then five minutes later being singing onward christian soldiers marching off to war with the cross of jesus going on before when he's the same guy that said love thy enemy as thyself if someone hits you, turn the other cheek. He didn't say go murder them and right. rape their fucking women and screw their children, which the Christians and uh, were you know, famous for with all their crusading, and, and Muslims did it too, but they weren't nearly as ruthless as the Christians based on the historical evidence that I've studied. But the, you know, the point is, is that we don't really find what God and relationships are about till we realize that it's love and all the rest of it's just a bunch of talk on paper and it scares the hell out of people. And that serves a function because what does it do to a young man that finally realizes he's got to figure things out for himself? He says, boy, I don't like being told that God wants this or I can only worship on these days or I have to go to a temple to find God. That's like saying, you know, everyone has to fight right-handed. Yeah. Well, <laughs> just, that's a bit of a problem if you're left-handed. What, are yeah. you a sinner now? <laughs> yeah. So how important do you think it is for almost, because we, I started med like a real meditation practice every day probably two years ago now. Yeah, it's and it's fucking helped me like Calm night, down. night and day. <laughs> yeah. Night and day just realizing what, not letting emotions take over and stuff. Mm -hmm. How important is it to you? Oh. A good meditation practice. You know, It's interesting. This happens at different stages in people's lives depending on how evolved they are as a soul and who their parents are and what kind of upbringing they've had. But I reached a point through Tai Chi and Qi Gong and even seated meditation, but it happened more profoundly with me because my body likes to move. It doesn't like sitting still a lot. So when I started getting really deep into Tai Chi and having experiences just as powerful as I could have on psychedelic medicines, even at high doses, I, um, I begin to realize that silence is actually bursting with information and energy. And that if you can take time out from the external kind of buzz of everything and dive into the ocean of silence. It's, uh, it's very, very, very powerful. It like resets everything and it helps you realize that really this is all an amazing illusion. It's all bouncing out of silence, but it's like froth on the beer. If you drop into the silence, the paradox is everything out there is still there, but it's as though all of a sudden a fish who had eyes on the top of his head and only saw the boats floating on the surface looked down and went, oh my God, there's a whole ocean down there. You know, so I find that if I have emotional healing to do or I have challenges to solve or I have a need for a deeper connection to God, uh, you know, anything that the ego mind can't grapple with, if I just stated as an intention, thank you, Great Spirit, for guiding me to an understanding of why I'm having this challenge with so-and-so or whatever. 
And then I just let go into the emptiness. And if my mind starts moving, I go, yes, I see you. Cool. And I just, Bring it back. you know, Steiner called it sleeping with one eye open. You try to go to sleep, but you leave one eye open so that you can see the visions and the messages coming to you from the psyche, from spirit. And then silence becomes very wild. I mean, it's like you're alive and dead at the same time. You're everywhere and here or nowhere and here. It's as though you have access to all possibilities at once and by just holding an intention and then relaxing, you tune yourself to that dimension of great spirit and you get the answers effortlessly. It might take a day, it might take a month, it might take a year, but the secret is just to be patient. Like I do a lot of deep meditations on really you know, deep questions like, who am I? <laughs> really, why am I here? Um, why are we all here? What is God? I mean, I've studied a lot about God and there's so many different opinions by smart people. So my thing is whenever you get conflicting opinions by people of equal quality, it means God's teasing you and saying, time for you to make up your own mind instead of reading all the time or listening <laughs> to other people. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so then I got to go have a little chat with the big great spirit. But wh when you get down into the silence, paradoxically, what do I tell you? It's, uh, <laughs> it doesn't make noise, but it sure does talk a lot. Yeah. I mean, and I mean talk as it fills you, mm -hmm. you know, with everything. Whatever it is you need, that magic well has it. But you have to be brave enough to go there, and the ego really resents it because as soon as you get rid of the mind chatter, the ego thinks, well, what am I going to do now? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm horny. <laughs> Have you? I want some coffee. I'm horny. You too. <laughs> I'm horny. I need fuck. more money. Yeah. I want someone to love me. I want someone to make my life completely easy, so I don't have to do anything. Have you read much of Eckhart Tolle? Or uh, I've studied quite a bit of him. I love him. Yeah. Uh, he's he's the real deal. Yeah, he's pretty cool. Like Man, a podcast with Paul and Eckhart that would be good. Oh my god. <laughs> I got. I, I would love to arrange that. I have to wait till I have a big enough following to make my number's interesting to him more. God, that would be so sweet. Oh, Either I'll do a painting for him and send it to him. <laughs> yeah, that would I be I think awesome. he would get the message. Make, I could communicate with him through art better than I could words. <laughs> yeah. God, yeah, that would be a good one. So if you could go back to when you were 25 years old, would you do anything differently? Uh, well... You know, the 25-year-old the got here to be hanging out with you guys. So I think, uh, I think that if you trust the universe, it's guiding you all the time. Um, if I was able to go back to be a different 25-year-old, I'd have to choose different parents at a different time in a different place. Mm -hmm. I don't think I made any mistakes that I regret. Um, I was very committed, you know, I was a hardcore athlete. I was seriously hardcore athlete. And, uh, you know, I was trainer of the army boxing team at that time and I was, you know, a triathlete and I had my hands full. I was a soldier in the 82nd Airborne Division. I worked on weapon systems on Cobra helicopters, which was my real job before I joined the boxing team full time. But I, I, I've given everything I've got to my life process. I really have not copped out on anything. You know, when I became a father, I did the best I could and still do. And when I left home, I made a commitment to myself to not have to be mommy and daddy's toy thing anymore. And that meant don't ask for money, do it yourself. So I've never had to look back. And I just, I had such a desperate need to be myself and be free and not have anyone tell me what to do that I would rather starve in a ditch than have other people telling me what to do. Definitely. And that's one of the reasons I had to get out of the army too. The army served, served me because it gave me a career opportunity, but I hated being told what to do by people that I didn't respect. Damn. Yeah, that's and good. when I found out what the army was really about, it was just a uh, you know, an industry that steals resources from other people and f manufactures fake threats. And 
the government's toying with the public's mind, and it's really in the military industrial. It's a business, right? Yeah. Just like keeping people sick is a business. So yeah. is the defense industry. It's all just a big fucking game. Business. And I just like, I couldn't, I couldn't devote myself to uh, risking my life for a bunch of rich people to get stinky rich and and slaughter anybody in the way. I, that's that's that, now I'm a Christian crusader again. Yeah. So my life taught me a lot of great stuff, and I had a lot of great experiences. And I mean, I guess the answer is the only thing I would do differently is I would probably ask the universe to put me somewhere near um, monks, uh, people that were truly conscious of what God really is and what life is about that could bring those qualities out of me more. You know, I was in a very violent house uh, with a violent father, um, uh, very hard working environment. And so, uh, and my parents fought a lot about money problems. And so I, as a kid, I just made a promise to myself, I'm going to do whatever I got to do to make enough money to have some freedom and not have my life be like this. And... I want to make sure whatever I do for a living, I can control the environment. I don't have people telling me what to do and I don't have to take orders from people that I don't respect. Yeah. So I just went fucking hell bent for leather and focused and followed my heart. And whenever my heart felt good, I knew pour your energy there. And it, it, it really set me free. It helped me heal all the pain of my childhood and, help me understand why people are in so much pain and yeah you know and i think i think uh we're we're all in the perfect situation you know we think of ourselves as separate but really the consciousness that is behind creation itself is the same consciousness in us so we're really acting out an ignorance which is called drinking from the river of forgetfulness. When you come into life and you take on a body, you drink from the knowledge of the truth of everything so that you can have this experience, right? If you knew everything, then nothing would be exciting to you. Um, so I think that, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, you reach a point where you realize there's, a, there's incredible perfection behind even the ugly and everything. And you realize that God isn't like people think God is. God's as committed to being the drug addict and the rapist and the murderer and the pedophile and the Adolf Hitler as God is the Buddha, the Jesus, and the Lao Tzu. Why? Because none of those things have any meaning without the other stuff. Can you have north without south? Yeah. East without west? Well, you can't have good without bad. You can't have love without evil, right? And what is evil? Well, write it down and read it backwards. L-I-V-E, backwards is E-V-I-L. Evil is living backwards. Evil is living in ways that do not sustain or nourish life. And what nourishes life is connection, right? When we love each other and we have children, we produce loving children that add something to the world. But when we don't love each other but we're having sex, we produce children that are raised by parents that don't love each other but have sex. And so they learn how to not love people and have sex with them. And they produce unhappy children that act in ways that draw more unhappiness to them that ultimately end up people that run through shopping malls with machine guns and kill people because yeah. that's just mirroring back to them what they thought life was. Yeah. So like, yeah, in, the, in this day and age too with the kids growing up, anxiety and depression are at an all-time high yeah. obviously and a lot of it has to do with social media mm -hmm. and bad food like how, how much are kids going to be when they start to become 30s late 20s that are raised from being all the side fifth, effects fifth grade fourth grade of having an instagram and twitter and watching porn we haven't from, even seen the side effects from yet. eight years old on well what are the side effects going to be like <laughs> We'll see. Well, let me ask you a question. When you look at statistics or you look in the news or you look at anything about the health of American, the American population, I mean, 61% of the Australian population is now overweight or obese. 
61% of a country that was once known for its healthy people. It's mm. fatter than the United States. Surveys show that um, 90% of 8 to 10 year olds in Australia think Ronald McDonald knows more about nutrition than their mother. <laughs> okay? Nine. So the answer to your question is if you look at what's going on right now, well, they're eating worse, more processed food, more genetically modified food, they're taking more drugs, they're doing less exercise, and they're becoming more addicted to screens as every year goes by. So if you say, what would it be like when those Kai? Would it be like what when up, those dude? kids are thirty? <laughs> just look backwards. So what was it like thirty years ago, compared to now? Well, we didn't have near as much video addiction. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have the internet. Mm -hmm. We had to do more exercise just because the nature of the way things work. You know. So, so what you see is we're actually losing our bodies and living in our minds to the point that we're forgetting what it takes to maintain a body. So pretty soon we're going to all be like Stephen Hawking <laughs> with just a, a blob uh, of cells yeah. that are sick and a head that, that makes sound and, and then nobody will be around to take care of the planet and it'll all die if we're not careful. <laughs> One thing I was super interested in was when you were talking about bees, yeah. how they can't sleep at, anymore. They're not getting enough darkness because of all the electricity going. Yeah, they can't rest because the light stimulates their hormonal system. So just like it does to human beings, right? If you have lights on in your house at night, it tells your brain, it thinks that's sunlight. So it tells your brain to keep releasing cortisol, which stimulates the brain. Lots of people that have sleep problems, I tell them, turn the lights off in your house two hours before sleep and use beeswax candles. And they all of a sudden realize they can sleep well again. And unplugging the Wi-Fi, that's where I think we yeah, heard it from. Yeah, you. yeah, unplugging the Wi-Fi is critical because it keeps the system very wound up. Especially when 5G starts coming 5G out, right? 5G is a death stroke, I hate to tell you, man. Fuck, that's it's, scary. it's yeah. coming, right? God. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's all over the place already. Let me tell you, I'm going to be interviewing Nick Pino on my podcast, uh, who's an expert in all this, and it's going to shock the hell out of people. But look, I was excited. I went on... We, Penny and Angie and Mana and I uh, went to Alaska on a cruise ship on vacation uh, last summer. And we took a helicopter ride. We were in uh, Seward, Alaska. Like, we we're long, a long ways out there, man. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's a little <laughs> town, you know, I don't know. It's like a little port town, maybe three, four, five thousand 5,000 people or something. And we took a helicopter ride up into the mountains and we got out of the helicopter and we're going to hike back two and a half miles down to this little town. So we're out in the middle of nowhere in the woods. And I just wondered if there was any cell reception out there. And I picked my phone up and it had five bars. I'm like, damn, I'm almost on the North Pole out here. God, and there's nice. five bars out here. That means these trees and plants and animals and microorganisms are being jacked. And I'm like, that's unbelievable. So God. it turns out that the guy that who we rented this this he, half of his house, he rents out to people, you know, coming to as tourists. And he he used to be, I think, the mayor of the town. He said, "Oh yeah, we have 5G." I'm like, "You sure do." And that <laughs> shit goes through mountains like they're not even there. Wow, that's <laughs> and, so scary. And that's a high frequency too. I mean, that is. There's already piles of research and reports of people getting very sick from it. It's, I'm telling you, they're putting that crap everywhere. In Rhode Island, they're mounting the 5G antennas on traffic lights, man, everywhere. Oh, oh, God. oh God. That's so scary. You might as well, we're all going to, you know, anywhere with 5G, you might just imagine you're in a microwave oven. You're just Fuck. getting the shit jacked out of you, man. It is gnarly. Yeah, I want to get one of those EMF detectors and see how it's going in the house and try yeah. to clear it up. So how are you going to re regulate Mana? What what time, what age are you going to give him a smartphone? How, how old is he now? Be? He's three. three. We, we let him use an iPad and we've got education stuff on there for him. And Do you monitor the time on the iPad? Yeah, we, 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 he's very physically active. So he he's not like a kid that, that we have to pull off of it. Yeah, It's just sort of something like, if he wants to enjoy himself a little bit, but he's very outdoorsy and athletic and eats excellent food. But he, he you know, and Steiner schools don't want you to have any of that for your kids, but we told the Steiners, I said, look, I'm not going to cut it out because the world he's growing into is going to be very technologically advanced, so I Everything. can't start him he's off. He's got to know. I can't start him off naked, 
but I will uh, monitor it so that it's not an addiction. So we treat that like we would treat something sweet like chocolate, oh. you know? Does, is yeah. he going to start – I remember hearing you say that um, in the, at the Steiner School, they're not supposed to start reading till 7. They don't want you reading till between 7 and 10 because it brings the left brain hemisphere on too soon so the kids lose their sense of connection to right. wholeness. So is that what he's going to be doing? Yes, he's That's in the Steiner School sweet. now. Yeah, he's already in the Steiner That's School. That's awesome. Yeah, he goes to a Steiner. Are the Steiner schools all over? Where? Pretty much. They're, you know, they're, they're small private schools. They're not cheap, um, but they're sure. good. How much are they a month? I don't know. I think we pay about 16000 a year for him. Okay. So Damn. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. Twelve hundred a month or something. Maybe hundred a month. If Penny can tell, I, I I don't remember exactly what it is. It's not cheap. Worth it. Maybe it's, it's eight. Worth it. Maybe Public it's schools 80, are scary. Might, it might be eight thousand five hundred a year. Somewhere around there, but still huh. totally. It worth actually it. works out to be, and because we take him there for, and he goes for three hours, uh, at three he goes three hours three days a week I think, and. Angie worked it out that it's actually cheaper than if we hired a nanny mm. to watch him. Oh, wow. So he gets to go to a Steiner school and really get engaged and learn a lot of cool stuff and be with other kids, which is great for his social development, for a couple bucks an hour less than it would cost us to hire a nanny to watch right. after And him. then when he mentions Penny and Angie, he has two wives. Yeah. Penny, his first wife, Angie, his second. Yeah. So just for you guys, because the, yeah, they're probably yeah. confused. So how lo lo late does the Steiner school go to? Like tw all, the way, all to the way to high grade? school? Through, through 12th grade. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Damn, that is really cool. That's probably what we'll end up. I mean, who Hell knows yeah. when we have kids, but that's definitely that's like the way to go. For it's hands down the best school system public schools in the are, world. They're, they're sixth, seventh, and eighth graders smoking these vape pens with that have Jewels. nicotine in them in sixth grade. Yeah, no, it's just bad. They're just emulating adults. Don't forget that. Yeah, yeah. No <laughs> the kids just mirror everybody around them. God. Like people get all upset. They're my kid, this, my kid, that. And I'm like, well, you're That's the one that programmed that little child. So. Li li yeah, literally programmed it. That's yeah. what we're doing. That's yep. there's an old saying. Why is it that your parents can push your buttons so easily? Because they're the ones that installed them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good. That's it good. Really good. <laughs> so when was your first time taking a good rip of weed? Oh, That's a good pot. question. Uh, well, my dad used to grow pot all over the farm. He, oh, really? He was, yeah, he burns? liked to smoke pot um, when I was a kid. And uh, my brother smoked pot. My brother was smoking pot pretty heavy from about the seventh grade on. Damn, seventh grade. Um, I used to worry that it might get in the way of my athletic training and, and you know boxing. And when I was young, I raced motocross, and I was very good at it and took it very seriously. I think I probably smoked pot the first time when I was around 15 or 16. I loved it. <laughs> I'm like, this is way better than alcohol. Who would oh, drink yeah. that shit after this? This is cool. <laughs> you know, I got more creative and I felt more connected and more relaxed. And I'm watching all my friends run around and beat the shit out of each other on alcohol. I'm like, hey, go you ahead. <laughs> I'll watch. You know, those teeth are expensive to fix, you guys. Have some of this. <laughs> That's what we tell a lot of our listeners, too, because our listeners are pretty young, 20s, and we say it. As long as you're doing it and doing positive shit, not yeah. just sitting there being a stoner, no. being lazy, use, using it as an excuse to just fucking gel out, using it to do positive stuff. You know, did I ever tell you I had a conversation with the marijuana spirit? Huh? Mm -hmm. Well, I went to this big marijuana plant and I said, do you have a message for humanity? And it said, yes. I said, what is it? said, don't just stand there. Grow. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah. That's nice. That's fucking solid. So what's your routine like with weed? Do you, <laughs> um, how much do you burn it? I like it in the evenings after work. I don't uh, use it during the day. I find, you know, that it makes my mind channel hop too much. Or I get so dreamy that a half an hour goes by and I haven't done anything. It's like it's great for in the evening to celebrate an accomplishment of a good productive day. Damn, that's Hell that's yeah. what we that's exactly what yeah. we use it as. Yeah, like, that's an accomplishment sweet. to a couple. Celebrate good every day, eating healthy. Yeah, like, that's it. But if you start your day with your reward, you usually end up being disappointed in yourself pretty soon. That's good. Fuck, yeah, you know? totally. And I've done that. 
I've been, I'm like, I'm supposed to wait and then I'm going to do this. I'm like, nah, I'm good. Yeah. yeah. But I have to experience and get that. I'm like, oh, shit, I can't do that. Well, it's, you know, marijuana is famous for inducing procrastination. So it, Munchies. It, munchies and procrastination. <laughs> so if you want to become someone that eats too much and doesn't get shit done, then smoke pot when you should be paying attention to what you're doing and making a difference in the world. Or are you just a dope head, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and that's a waste of pot. <laughs> it is it really sure. is pot's a great medicine and it's great for spiritual healing and connection but if you let any drug stop you from fulfilling yourself and why you came to the world then you have um you have a deeper problem right you have a deeper problem it means that you don't really realize the the um the incredible majesty and value of a human life Just right it. if you lose someone like i did like a brother to suicide or my father died when i was eight when you lose somebody that you love the intensity of that experience you think how would my life be different if they were still alive well when you realize how potent and how valuable and how precious any one human life is then you don't live in ways that limit your ability to fully live. In a, in a, a, most drugs are being used to avoid life, to avoid responsibility, to avoid productivity, uh, to avoid fear-based thinking without accepting that it's your own fear-based thinking. So you numb yourself out. Um, but any drug that can be a tool for creativity and a tool for relaxation and a tool for connection is a beautiful drug as long as it keeps you connected and creative and productive. Hmm. And so I believe there's no such thing as a bad drug, only an incorrectly prescribed drug. And there's no such thing as a bad exercise, only an incorrectly prescribed exercise. But you have to have... uh, you have to become an adult to manage life because you can fuck your life up with money. You can fuck your life up with sex. You can screw it up with drugs. You can screw it up with power. You can screw it up with uh, authority. You can screw it up lots of ways, right? So, you know, that's why I tell my students, number one thing you got to do is have a dream bigger than your crisis or you'll always be medicating your perceived poor me syndrome Mm -hmm. and the next thing you know you wake up and you're 40 and all you've done is been a filtration system for pot and drugs and alcohol yeah and And for a lot of the younger people listening who are like at the age where they're trying to figure out oh what should i do should i go to college should i do this what should i do take hlc one here you go take hlc run he'll have you write down your dreams write down your goals steps to take to get to it eat healthy and shit that really fucking matters. But we're at an hour and a half. We could, I feel like I could talk to you for six hours. It felt plus. like 15 minutes, yeah. man. I, well, even, well, I want to ask you, yeah. before when you, do you smoke and then go to meditate? And like, I, I love, I love pot uh, and Tai Chi together or meditation together. Um, we, some pots are better than, than others. Uh, some can take you over so much right. that it's, it's almost like you got to work against it. Right. Uh, especially if they're not organic, outdoor grown, because totally. the chemicals they put yeah. in there can just be mess with you a lot. Um, we'll have to do Tai Chi and yeah, I I would, we've never done to do Tai that. Chi. I would love to. Oh, learn is that, that. right? It's, None of, never. Because I can't Simple. sit still very. I like to, like you said, you like to move. I feel like yeah. that's how I am. Because I, if you got, these guys know me, I can't fucking sit still for five. Yeah, seconds. well, you're young and you still got a lot of fire in you, but uh, uh, you know just practice the zone exercise uh, right in my book and you know I'll, I'll i'll show you how to do sugar sean tai chi man <laughs> damn that'll be tight because i yeah. see what you do you like to you, you like to uh do shadow boxing a lot i see you guys both dancing and moving right and that's in <laughs> the blood of a fighter right so all you do is you <laughs> that's good take that down into yourself so inhale, exhale. Mm. 
God, I feel like I could do that a lot better than I could sit. <sighs> Fuck yeah. You slow it down so that all the movements are exactly timed to your breathing. If you're getting shorter, exhale. If you're getting taller, inhale. Yeah. So coming back, I'm getting taller, inhale. Throwing the punch. Like a cat cow in yoga, right? Then you remember inhalation draws energy in. So if you cup your hand, you can suck chi, your life force energy in from space by just visualizing and feeling yourself pulling it in. Then when you want to move stuck energy out of yourself, you open your hand and project whatever you're holding on to right through your hand and you can move energy in and out of your body just like magic. We'll have to, we'll have to do that next badass. time we come and do your, do your podcast. We'll have to plan another trip out here because oh, yes. this has been so fun. Stacking rocks, doing drums, just being smoking here. with you and e hanging each out. Each room has bookshelves of books but just being here makes you want to fucking up it up even it. more for us yeah. go back home and try to copy the heaven house at our own yeah, house. do it awesome thank you heavy I, heaven is something you want to copy and distribute yeah right right because heaven is a place full of love so you know i i just i just create the environment that inspires me to experience the love I want to share with the world and that I, the way I wish everybody could live. And so really that's what all my students are is people that I'm doing my best to teach how to have the kind of freedom and health and vitality that I have, right? Fuck yes. Right. Living 4D. Living 4D. Check Paul out Check. Paul's Thank podcast. You. And at Paul Check on Instagram, at Check Institute. But thanks so much, man. Yeah, My pleasure. This has been it's fucking fun to, awesome. Fun to be with you guys. It's crazy hearing you, like we, because we listen to your podcast all the time and watch your videos, and like just weird hearing, like yeah. it's just fucking sweet. I was super, <laughs> I was super nervous driving up. I was like, Fuck, we're going to be mad. It's be <laughs> <laughs> but I, I knew we'd get yeah, along great. I, awesome. I, I just yeah. knew we would. But yeah. it's funny with these podcasts. You, as soon as you see the person, you think, oh, I, I know them, but they don't know you. Yeah. But you're like, oh, I hear him every day. Mm -hmm. I so feel you guys. Pretty cool. That's awesome. I can pretty feel cool. your presence. I, I. I, you know, I watched your Joe Rogan interview and saw clips on here and there and, you know, the I, man I, 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 I felt like you guys are a lot more tapped in than most of the fight community. So I thought, okay, these guys, I got to make sure they have access to HLC one. I got to make sh you know, sure that I let them know I'm watching and, and they're on the right track. Remember, I'm like that marijuana plant. Don't just stand there, grow. <laughs> Yeah, fuck Perfect. yeah. I'm so glad we're part of the team now. Yeah, have you, you are, as a yeah. contact, man. Yeah. Thank Love you, yes, brother. Thanks. Thank you. Hell yeah.